Hello and welcome to Indus News, live from Islamabad. I am Muneeb Hamid with the news of this hour. Let's begin with the top stories first. U.S. President Joe Biden says the Kabul evacuation is one of the most difficult airlifts in history and is not without risk of loss. Speaking at the White House, Biden said the Al-Qaeda is gone from Afghanistan after 20 years of U.S.-led operations. But Pentagon Press Secretary John Kirby has confronted the president's statement saying Al-Qaeda as well as ISIS are still present in Afghanistan. Meanwhile, the Taliban said they aim to unveil a new governing framework for Afghanistan in the next few weeks. Indian troops have martyred three civilians in occupied Jammu and Kashmir's Pulwama district. The victims were targeted during a so-called search operation at Nakhbariyan Tral area of the district. The occupying troops have killed over 400 Kashmiris since New Delhi's illegal revocation of the valley's special status in August 2019. The United States has sanctioned several Russian companies that, according to it, are engaged in the construction of Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Moscow's ambassador to Washington says the new curbs violate international law. Earlier, the U.S. also sanctioned Russia on transfer of weapons-related technology over the issue of blogger Alexei Navalny. Brazil has recorded over 800 deaths from the COVID-19 and more than 33,000 infections overnight. Meanwhile, in Pakistan, 65 more people lost their lives to the virus and over 3,000 tested positive in the last 24 hours. Globally, the coronavirus caseload has surpassed 210 million, while the death toll is over 4.4 million. These were the top stories news in detail after a short break. Stay with us. Welcome back. Now let's have the news in detail. U.S. President Joe Biden says the Kabul evacuation is one of the most difficult airlifts in history and is not without risk of loss. Biden said 50 to 65,000 Afghan allies are hoping to leave, but the evacuation of American citizens is the priority. Since Taliban's takeover of Afghanistan, several countries have intensified efforts to evacuate people with the situation worsening at the Kabul airport. U.S. President Joe Biden said all Americans and U.S. allies will be evacuated, but said he cannot promise what the final outcome would be. Speaking at the White House, Biden said the Al-Qaeda is gone from Afghanistan after 20 years of U.S.-led operations. However, Pentagon Press Secretary John Kirby has confronted the president's statement saying Al-Qaeda as well as ISIS are still present in Afghanistan. Meanwhile, NATO said some 12,000 foreigners and Afghans working for embassies and international aid groups have been evacuated. In another development, Indonesia has temporarily moved its diplomatic mission from Kabul to Pakistan. Meanwhile, Russian President Vladimir Putin said the West must stop the irresponsible policy of imposing foreign values. Speaking at Kremlin, Putin said the US-led intervention cannot be called a success. Whereas China says Afghans must decide the future of their country and all parties should respect it. Moreover, the Taliban said they aim to unveil a new governing framework for Afghanistan in the next few weeks. A spokesperson said the mess at Kabul airport was not created by the Taliban as the West could have had a better plan to evacuate. The spokesperson vowed the reports of reprisals by members will be investigated and the culprits will be held accountable. As you have witnessed, U.S. President Joe Biden once again said that the Kabul evacuation is one of the most difficult airlifts in the history and is not without risk of loss. Now, uh, U.S. President also said 50 to 65,000 Afghan allies are hoping to leave, but the evacuation of the American citizens is the priority. Also, he said this is one of the largest and most difficult airlifts in history. And Biden also went on to said in a televised address from the White House that I cannot promise what the final outcome will be. 
The president said United States forces have airlifted 13,000 uh, people out of Afghanistan since August 14 and 18,000 since July. Now for more on this we have joined by Sumera Khan, our correspondent. Now Sumera, please update us with the latest you have. I'm present here at the Pakistan's embassy in Afghanistan. It is the main embassy in Kabul and uh, we are here to observe the operational facilities that are being provided by the uh, embassy and uh, in a short while Pakistan's envoy to Afghanistan Mansoor Ahmed Khan will be coming to have uh, 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 he'll be coming to visit all these people who are right now waiting here. Uh, according to my information that was given to me by the embassy officials uh, around 390 people have been uh, uh, they, they have been accommodated today. Half of them have been sent to the airport, Kabul airport, uh, Hamid Karzai International Airport to get them aboard on the evacuation flight. That evacuation flight uh, came from Pakistan yesterday and it was a chartered flight aimed at evacuating people from Afghanistan. And uh, those who were evacuated through the airport. They include Turkish, Polish, Afghans and few Pakistanis as well. So it is, uh, it is an ongoing process. Uh, the evacuation flights are coming to Kabul from Pakistan and when they go back, they have uh, uh, many uh, uh, national they, uh, those who hail from different embassies, uh, different uh, UN agencies and uh, different parts of the uh, ministries as well who are there right now in Afghanistan but they were stuck uh, here due to some reasons or the other reason was that their countries could uh, were not able to evacuate them uh, in, in a proper time frame but uh, generally if I, uh, if I speak to anyone they are of the view that the respective countries are right now they are not responding in a manner that they should have been responding to, responded to their uh, citizens. But now the Pakistan embassy, you can see that uh, in, in the background that there is a system in place. Uh, they, are, uh, they, they, they are facilitated through. They come here, they sit here, and then one by one, their, uh, uh, the, their documents, they get verified. And after that, uh, uh, those who travel uh, by road to Pakistan, by Torkham border, through Torkham border, they are separate right now. Those people, uh, people who are traveling through road, they are sitting here, but those who are traveling by air, they have been sent earlier uh, to the Kabul International Airport. Uh, I'll be uh, updating you as uh, the, the moment I get more updates. Stay tuned. Right, Samara Khan, thank you very much. Reporting from Kabul at the Pakistan's embassy. Now, thank you very much, Samara Khan, our correspondent in Kabul, Afghanistan, right now. Now, moving on with other news stories, Indian troops have martyred three civilians in occupied Jammu and Kashmir's Bulwama district. The victims were targeted during a so-called search operation at the Nakhbariyan Tral area of the district. The operation was going on till last reports came in. It comes a day after the occupying troops martyred two civilians in the same district's Pampur area. Indian troops have killed over 400 Kashmiris since New Delhi's illegal revocation of the valley's special status in August 2019. Now, the U.S. has slapped sanctions on a Russian ship and two companies involved in the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline. President Joe Biden signed an executive order to impose the curbs. In a statement, the State Department said Washington has now sanctioned seven persons and blocked 16 of their vessels. Moscow's ambassador to Washington says the new curbs violate international law. Earlier, the U.S. and the U.K. sanctioned Russia over the issue of Kremlin critic Alexei Navalny. Meanwhile, German Chancellor Angela Merkel urged President Vladimir Putin to free Navalny during her official visit to Russia. She also insisted on extending a gas transit deal with Ukraine. Now, US President Joe Biden's special envoy for North Korea has arrived in South Korea for discussions of a stalled nuclear diplomacy with Pyongyang. The U.S. State Department said Sung Kim will meet his South Korean counterpart No Q Duck and other officials during his four-day visit. Upon his arrival at the Incheon International Airport, Sung told reporters he is expecting the visit to be very productive. He said he would also be meeting his Russian counterpart Igor Mogulov, who is also scheduled to land in South Korea today. The visit comes amid a standoff over U.S.-South Korean military exercises that North Korea has warned could trigger a security crisis. Shortly after preliminary training for the exercises began last week, North Korea also stopped answering the hotlines. 
Now, Israeli troops have wounded 14 Palestinians in the occupied West Bank. They were protesting against illegal Jewish settlements. The Palestinian Red Crescent said Israeli forces fired live rounds and rubber bullets at the protesters. It said dozens of more Palestinians were affected by tear gas. Protests took place in the Beta village of Nablus province in the West Bank. For months now, Beta has been witnessing protests against Israel's illegal settlement outpost near the village Eve Tear. Now moving on, Damascus has urged the UN Security Council to act firmly to prevent Israeli attacks on Syrian territory. In a letter, Syrian Foreign Ministry said Israel launched missiles to target posts around Damascus and Homs on Thursday evening. It said Tel Aviv carried out the acts of aggression to prolong the war on Syria and raising the morale of terrorists. It said the UN must also hold Israel accountable for its terrorism and crimes committed against the people of Syria, Lebanon and Palestine. Now the Somali army says it has killed 60 al Shabaab terrorists in an operation in the southwestern province of Lower Shabeli. In a tweet, the military said the terrorists were grouped up outside of Sabid and Kanule villages. It said the troops raided the terrorist hideouts in an intel-based operation. The army added the slain militants include two senior commanders. Earlier, the military said it has eliminated at least 279 terrorists affiliated with the Al-Shabaab group just in the past month. Now, Brazil has recorded over 800 deaths from the COVID-19 and more than 33,000 infections overnight. Globally, the death toll is over 4.4 million, while the case load has surpassed 210 million. More about the pandemic in this report. More than a year and a half of on-off lockdown measures around the world has made people extremely wary. But the latest surge of Delta-driven outbreaks has given rise to yet another wave of sweeping curbs. The U.S. extended the closure of its land borders with Canada and Mexico to non-essential travel such as tourism through 21st of September. Florida officials are threatening to withhold funds if school districts in two countries do not immediately do away with strict mask mandates. In Australia, anti-lockdown protesters clashed with police in Melbourne as the country reported a record high daily infections. Meanwhile, an anti-lockdown protest in Brisbane joined a large march in Melbourne and a smaller demonstration in Sydney. New Zealand's Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern warned that COVID-19 cases will go higher in the country in the next few days and urged adherents with new restrictions. South Africans formed hundreds of metres long queues to get their COVID-19 shots after the government made vaccinations available to all adults. Sri Lanka has begun its 10-day lockdown as surging infections and deaths overwhelm the island's health system. A study shows that Euro 2020 final at London's Wembley Stadium in July was a super spreader event. The AstraZeneca said its new antibody therapy reduced the risk of developing COVID-19 symptoms by 77% in its late-stage trial. Meanwhile, the World Health Organization urged experts to join its advisory group Origins of Novel Pathogens after China criticized a new study had been politicized. Meanwhile, in Pakistan, coronavirus has claimed 65 more lives overnight. The health ministry says the death toll is approaching 25,000. The ministry said nearly 3,100 tested positive in the past 24 hours. It added the positivity rate of overnight infections declined to 5.73%. Pakistan's caseload has exceeded 1,119,000, while over a million have recovered. The number of active cases has crossed 89,000, of which more than 5,100 are critical. More news coming up in this news bulletin after a short break. Stay with us. Welcome back. Now, India's top opposition parties have called for unity to defeat the Bharatiya Janata Party in the 2024 elections. After a virtual meet, Congress leader Sonia Gandhi said the opposition has no alternative to working together in national interest. In a joint statement, the leaders of the 19 parties demanded the restoration of Jammu and Kashmir statehood. They also called for the release of political prisoners and free and fair elections. The leaders announced joint protest action between September 20 and 30. 
The added Prime Minister Modi's Independence Day speech was full of misinformation. Meanwhile, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi's popularity ratings have fallen from 66% to 24 over one year. In a survey, over 14,000 respondents were asked who would be the best suited to be the next Prime Minister of India. Respondents cited Modi's handling of the coronavirus pandemic as the primary reason for lower ratings. Over 70% of respondents said infections and fatalities were higher than the Indian government's figures. Regarding Kashmir, over 40% of people said the full statehood should be restored. While 25% were in favour of restoring both the statehood as well as the valley's special status. As many as 51% said they are scared to protest or express anything on any platform from the fear of being arrested. Now the UN chief has called on Burkina Faso to swiftly bring the perpetrators of violence in the country to justice. In a statement, Secretary General Antonio Guterres said the authority should not spare any effort to identify the culprits. Condemning the incident, Guterres said he is deeply concerned by the spiral of violence in the Liptako Goma region. He also reiterated the United Nations solidarity with the government and the people of Burkina Faso. Meanwhile, the death toll from Wednesday's attack in northern Burkina Faso rose to 80. Moving on now, the U.S. government's humanitarian agency says aid workers will run out of food in Ethiopia's Tigray region this week. In a statement, a U.S. aid official said the humanitarian organizations have depleted their stores of food items. Samantha Powell added people in Tigray are starving with up to 900,000 in famine conditions. She said more than 5 million people are in desperate need of humanitarian assistance. Pawo lamented the Ethiopian government for what she called obstruction of humanitarian aid. The Tigray conflict has killed thousands and sparked a humanitarian crisis in one of the world's poorest regions. And the world is observing the International Day of Remembrance and, and tribute to the victims of terrorism today. On this day, people honour the individuals and communities that have been traumatised by terrorist acts. The day was established by a General Assembly resolution in 2017. This year's United Nations observance focuses on the importance of connections to heal the trauma, especially during the pandemic. It says hateful ideologies continue to injure, harm and kill thousands of innocent people each year. On the occasion, Pakistan condemned all forms of terrorism, including as an instrument of state policy. In a statement, a Foreign Office spokesperson honoured the 80,000 Pakistani martyrs of war on terror along with over 90,000 Kashmiris as well as Palestinian martyrs. He called on the international community to take effective measures to suppress this terrorism beyond narrow political interests. Now, a swathe of the U.S. East Coast is under alert as the tropical storm Henry is expected to gain hurricane strength by today. The U.S. National Hurricane Center said the storm will make landfall in southern New England by late Sunday. Storm Henry is expected to become the first hurricane to hit the New England area in decades. Forecasters warned of violent winds, the risk of flash floods and surging seas as the storm churned in the Atlantic. Officials in the New England region warned people to get ready. Also in the U.S., more than a dozen wildfires burning in the state of California have scorched nearly 1.5 million acres of land. The Dixie Fire, the largest currently burning and second biggest on record, has wiped out the historic town of Cranville. The wildfire has burned over 700,000 acres in the northern part of the state and still continues to threaten thousands of homes. Meanwhile, another fast-moving blaze, the Caldo Fire, has charred more than 73,000 acres and forced thousands to abandon their homes. Over in Europe, wildfires have burned more than 135,000 acres of dry forest in Bolivia. Firefighters have reported 15 different blazes in eight municipalities of the country's Santa Cruz department. In France, a major blaze that killed two people has stopped expanding for the first time since it broke out on Monday. However, it still remains unextinguished and officials are fearful that the weekend winds might reignite it. 
Now, the deforestation in the Brazilian Amazon has hit the highest annual level in a decade. The Brazilian Research Institute said from August last year to July 2021, the rainforest lost 10.4 square kilometers. In 2020, destruction of the world's largest rainforest rose 9.5 percent from a year earlier to 2.7 million acres. Data from Brazil's National Space Research Agency, NPE, shows this area is seven times the size of London. That means Brazil will miss its own target, established under a 2009 climate change law for reducing deforestation to roughly 3,900 square kilometers. So this does not escape from what is our responsibility. These are the real numbers. We cannot escape from this and we have to improve it. We have until 2022 to put this issue in order and bring it to the point that we think would be an optimal point. While environmentalists blame the government for the rise, federal officials hail the figures as a sign of progress in fighting deforestation. As the increase was far lower than the 34 percent recorded in 2019. What I can say is this. Our goal in the Paris Agreement was that by 2025, we had to have a 37 percent reduction in carbon emissions compared to 2005, which was the year all countries committed to. I think we will keep that goal. We may announce a new target for 2030. European leaders such as the French President Emmanuel Macron have fiercely criticized Brazil, arguing it is not doing enough to protect the forest. The election of Joe Biden as a U.S. president has raised the possibility that the United States will also ramp up pressure on Brazil over the rainforest. And with that, we come to the end of this news bulletin. For the latest updates, you can follow us on social media at End of Scott News.